Welcome to the show. I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to the UK's leading biohacker and the founder of the Health Optimization Summit in London, which is probably Europe's biggest biohacking event. Uh, his name is Tim Gray, and he's a new friend of mine who we met, uh, I guess we met in 2023, and we're here in London, England. And Tim, how are you, mate? Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, mate, you are the UK's leading biohacker. For the uninitiated, what does biohacking mean and what is a biohacker? This label always makes me laugh, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, so biohacking, <clears throat> by definition from the founder... Uh, Dave Asprey, was to optimize the environment inside of you and outside of you to take control of your own biology. That's a very interesting way of describing it for sure. I would say it's about understanding what our body needs to thrive and which technologies or supplements or lifestyle changes can be utilized to make you live the healthiest you. That's basically what I would say biohacking is. And that can include tracking with you know things like the Aura Ring, mm. Um, or a whoop bracelet, or, you know, even if you're using an Apple watch, you know, even though I'm not a fan of them for some reasons, which I'm sure we're going to, um, tracking these things, seeing what your body needs as an individual, and then optimizing based on what you need. Mm. Instead of going to the doctor and saying, I have sleep problems, for instance, and him giving you a sleeping tablet, <clears throat> you're going to a biohacker or a functional practitioner and say, I'm having sleeping problems, and they say, are you using blue light before bed or, you know, are you stressed or what's your diet like and are you exercising and blah, 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 blah. And so there's a one size fits all. It's for you specifically. And that's what biohacking really does. It take, lets you take control of your own health for you as an individual. I would submit that biohacking really is common sense health. What do you think of that? Yep. Yes, it is. It is. For sure. But I mean, it's not as funky or sellable for, you know, for people that make money from the label biohacking. It's not as it's not as funky saying it's common sense, but it is definitely like, for instance, one of the one of the uh, patterns that I saw after being in biohacking for, you know, must be good 10, 12 years now, I guess, in total, is that every biohack mimics nature, every decent biohack, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, replacing oxygen on a cellular level altitude training well that's obvious because it helps our body deal with oxygen carbon dioxide better red light therapy sunset blue light sad lighting sunrise you know all of these things mimic nature in some way the ones that are effective even pemf devices or ems or any of these things so really it is like understanding that we need technology to reverse the damages of technology. <laughs> and that is common sense. Yeah. So is biohacking essentially going back to living like when we were cavemen and cave women? Is that a overly simple way of describing it? You could say that. And you could say that it is like being a caveman. But the thing is, the reality is, is the caveman didn't have an iPhone. And, you know, or had headphones or, you know, a treadmill. Um, I, but I think it's about the mindset of what worked for the caveman. Because I don't want to be a hermit in a little cabin on a desert island. Actually, maybe I do these days. But <laughs> the point is, is I like the luxuries or some of these technologies. For instance, you know, I run several companies from an iPhone. And my teams I keep in contact with on WhatsApp. A caveman wouldn't have had those things. Um, so I think taking the things that help us thrive and minimizing the things that stop us from thriving is the right approach. Yeah. One of my companies is uh, Swanick Sleep. We produce blue light blocking glasses, scientifically proven to block the blue light from screens and light. That ends up disrupting your melatonin production and that affects your sleep mm. quality. And I always say to people, the absolute number one best thing you can do for your sleep, and then they think I'm going to say wear blue blockers from my company, Swanick Sleep, but I say is actually live your life at nighttime by candlelight. Mm. Like literally mm. live in the dark and just have flame, candles, and that's it. Don't, don't use electricity. And people are shocked by that. It's like, oh, what do you mean? And then I go on to explain that wearing a pair of quality blue blockers, for example, is in 
my opinion, the second best thing you can do because, to your point, we're not going to live our life by candlelight. Like we, we like the cell phone, we like mm. the microwave, we like the kitchen light, the street light, the speedometer light, we like all the modern luxuries. And so my submission is the next best thing you can do mm. than sitting in the dark is wear a quality pair mm. of blue blockers. So yeah. I would suggest that what biohacking is, mm. what common sense is, is simply what is the the best thing you can do to reduce the negative consequences of the modern world. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, succinctly said. Yeah. I agree. Tell us how you got into this game. How did you become interested and then obviously create a whole business and lifestyle and all the impact that you've created? I was a quote unquote successful business guy running a seven figure company from startup through to sale and I was working hard, playing hard, you know, I would wake up at eight, get into the office, start on my first cup of coffee, probably have four or five through the day, you know, hardly eat, hardly hydrate, um, finish work at six. And then when I get home, I'd in about seven, I would then work through till 10 o'clock on other projects and then eat some food, which could be crappy food or whatever it may be. I had no idea, maybe a Chinese takeaway, whatever, and then jump into bed. Wash, rinse and repeat five days a week and at the weekend go out and get absolutely wasted and say that that was my de-stress and thinking that that was a happy, healthy life, <laughs> ridiculously. And that's how oblivious I was to health. I had no health issues up until that point, nothing at all. And then when I hit about 32, I started getting kidney stones um, and that was the beginning of it. And then that stressed me out so much for a whole year so stressed because I was wondering if I was going to pop one of those kidney stones out any time or get stuck because it rushed me into hospital one day that I was so stressed that I got chronic fatigue and then brain fog and then my immune system started dropping then I started getting teeth infections and needed loads of root canal treated teeth and things started spiraling out of control you know more and more antibiotics you know, more and more sick more and more depressed and anxious because of all the antibiotics which I now know is you know, obviously because of the microbiome. Back in those days, we didn't know this stuff. Um, and I went to the doctors very frequently. In fact, I got to know the receptionist's name, first name basis, and I could text them and say, I'm coming in, you know, and this is NHS doctors as well. So it's like shows how close I was to the guys. And one day I was in five days in a row. One week, sorry, I was in five days in a row. And I said to the doctor, I'm like, Dr. Norris, what's wrong with me? And he shrugged his shoulders and said, can't find anything wrong. And it was like, I was at the end, I was at the end of the road. I just really just, I didn't say that I was, you know, had dark, dark thoughts at the time because it would raise alarm bells, but I really was at the end of it. And I was just like, I've gone from being this vibrant, successful, wealthy dude to not even being able to leave the house and my mum having to drive me to the doctors at, you know, 32, 33, 34 years old. So um, <clears throat> I started researching on forums, Cure Zone, different sites, and got a pack of post-it notes and dealt with it like a business problem. Like, what are all the symptoms? How do they all tie together? And started researching, picking up books, destroying them, everything I could everywhere, and then figured it out that actually I had mercury poisoning. Um, I had seven metal fillings. I have a gene SNP, the methylation, MTHFR and MTRR uh, SNP, which means I don't methylate properly, which means I don't detoxify properly, which means I store mercury quite well, which means that that then hampers your immune system because mercury is the second most neurotoxic substance known to man, man non-man made. So I had to figure out mercury chelation and then fixing my immune and then fixing my gut from the antibiotic use and blah, 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 blah. So really it was through a place of no one knowing how to help me. Since then, since, you know, for 12, 13 years ago now, something like that, functional health space has evolved significantly. I mean, biohacking, you know, is about 12 years old, I think now, when Dave founded it and did his first conference, I think it was 10 years ago, maybe. Um, it's evolved a lot. We now have influencers on Instagram, myself included, sharing out information that people just weren't aware of, uh, such as the dangers of EMF and blue light and all this stuff. Um, also, there's functional medicine practitioners that are now going through all their training, which are traditional doctors that have been trained to be functional medicine doctors, which is an additional qualification on top. And um, I think the world has become so sick 
and so many people have chronic health issues that and we all know that the medical system is actually failing and it's becoming more and more prevalent as a result there's more and more information and more and more people trying to make money from from it but also instead of making money from sickness they're making money getting people back to health so it's evolved a lot um and mine was just through a need personal need self-motivation it was like mm. literally i had the gun to my head yeah um and then how it evolved into a career i was i mean i just i just kept on optimizing and always striving for more because i realized i'd been operating at 60 percent for years um you know and i could have been so much more successful and so much more happier and so much more fulfilled if i had known some of these things so i just carried on and you know it's always chasing that next level of optimization but also i have had some chronic health issues to deal with as well viral for me and it always holds me accountable it always keeps me in check because if i let go of everything and have no health issues you know i might become complacent mm. because there's always something lurking around for me to deal with i always am on it you know like 95 percent on it so then i share this stuff on instagram um and started a meetup group in London, which grew and grew and grew. Mm. Next thing I know, I'm running, started the Health Optimization Summit uh, 2019, and we're in year four this year, and we're going to be around 3,200 people. Yeah, incredible. Uh, our guest today, you can follow him on Instagram, which is Tim Biohacker, at Tim Biohacker. I'm curious, Tim, was it shocking to you when the traditional doctor said, we don't know what's wrong with you. It didn't shock me, but it was almost like I didn't have a safety net anymore. And I think this is why a lot of people put a lot of trust in their doctors, because everyone in our world is a heuristic to us. For instance, you know, I don't need to research the deepest level of blue blocking glasses, or in fact, I probably have anyway, but it's irrelevant. I don't need to because I can trust someone that has and then we have that as a heuristic, you know, for instance, you know, we trust if we hire a nanny for our kid, we trust that that person has more experience in nannying than we do. Mm. So that's a heuristic for us. It's a shortcut. It's the same with a doctor or a dentist or any of these things. You trust that they know it better than you do so they can work for you better than you can. OK, mm -hmm. but when you go, well, actually, this person doesn't know better to get me right. We have to take control of it. And for me, the feeling was oh shit, I'm going to have to figure some stuff out because this guy has no clue. Mm. And I think, you know, for the average person, the average Homer Simpson, yeah, he might he might actually be able to help with symptoms, with drugs, whatever. But for me as an individual, he had no idea. And he had a limited set of tests that looked for a limited set of things. And it wasn't until I ventured out of that and looked actually there's a whole load of things that they just don't even know to test for. So I was just, uh, it was just a reality check of, oh shit, I can't, I have to hold myself accountable now. I have to take control of this. Now, more than a decade later, do you feel like you know more about health than many or most doctors who go through medical school and are licensed and are practicing today? About medicine? No, I do not know medicine well at all. About health, I know about health very well. And doctors are not trained in health. They have a day's worth of training on nutrition alone in their seven years of training. I have read hundreds of books. I have met with many experts. I've interviewed them. I have listened to them. I have studied them, I've l tested it. I would say in terms of health, I know more than the doctor would. Maybe mm. not than a functional medicine doctor or a functional practitioner. But yeah, in terms of health, yes, definitely. I mean, like the doctor will never ask you, do you get your shoes off and stand in the garden? You know, And for those listening to this that might think that's woo-woo, actually there's 23 or 24 studies now, including peer-reviewed studies showing that grounding has such a benefit for health. And anyway, does the doctor ever ask you that? Oh, I'm stressed. Do you have a ground? No. Okay, what's your, is your blood flowing freely? Mm, uh, it looks like your red blood cells are clumped together. Okay, so get some grounding in. They don't know any of this stuff. They don't ask you if you drink filtered water and if you remineralize it with the right electrolytes when you're, when you're fatigued. You know, if you're low in testosterone, they just give you testosterone. They don't say, well, what is going on? So I would say they don't know about health, but they know about symptoms and they know about 
the medicines to help those symptoms. Let's assume that there is a doctor listening to this. <laughs> He's going to hate me right now. <laughs> what would he or she be thinking right now? What would be their rebuttal of mm -hmm. whatever you're arguing here regarding traditional medicine and health? There's two things to this. There's the growth mindset doctors that say, we always want to be better. We are here to make people healthier. There are also the ones that say, no, that's not, he doesn't know, he's not medically qualified, he doesn't know this stuff, he doesn't know this stuff until there's studies, we can't implement it. But let's just put this to a second. Imagine it was your son that was super sick and traditional medicine didn't know what to do. Wouldn't you want to hunt out to fix your son? You would. And if you didn't, because you're like, oh, no, it's not proven, you're an idiot. Because ultimately, it's your son. And that puts it into perspective. But I think if you are practicing medicine for many years and you have been, quote unquote, helping people with medicines and all of a sudden you're told what you've been doing is actually harming people or the wrong thing, on a psychological level, that's going to have a massive impact. So anyone that's listening to this going, he's not medical, medically qualified, I'm not giving medical advice. I'm teaching you or teaching people what to do to help their body operate as it should that's not dealing with any issues or any symptoms or any sickness. So it's how does, the, how does the machine run as it should do and what does it need? So if they are thinking, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about and I know better, I would question why is your mind closed to actually further advancements and having to wait for a study on something when we don't need a study to prove that banging our head against the wall hurts us. Mm. you know so why would we wait for one we just know intuitively and that's where you know common sense kicks in unfortunately common sense isn't that common these days and we follow what we've been taught and you know the medical system teaches doctors to prescribe and it's built a certain way for a certain industry and everyone's waking up to this fact so i would question why why you're closed off to it and if it's because you've been helping people for so many years and you would hate to think that you've been hurting people or haven't been doing the right thing for them i'm sorry but you can change that as of today what do you think the worst piece of advice that most doctors give to patients is <laughs> take this medicine <laughs> um you know i mean there's like I, I don't sit in doctor's practices, so I don't really know what they suggest other than what I've heard from people I've, you know, consulted with or discussed with. Or And I think the doctor's way of just saying, what's the symptoms? Okay, what can we give you? What drug can we give you to treat those symptoms is probably the, you know, the biggest thing. And also, if you look at one of the leading causes of deaths in the world is misprescribed medicines. Yeah, what is that rate? It's I've been reading this, and there seems to be some debate about this. Do you want to pull up the stat? Yeah, I'm going to pull up the stat, but I think it's the third leading cause in the world. Um, the third leading yeah. cause of death in the world is patients being misdiagnosed. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, All right, Tim's just looking up the actual stat here. In 2013, estimated that prescription drugs are the third le leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Wow. Um, and in 2015, psychiatric drugs alone are a third leading cause of death. Wow. Now, the thing is, if you think about mental health, we now know that the gut is, I mean, it's been proven that the gut is directly linked to brain health. And when you look at people's missing gut bacteria, and you see that they don't break down proteins properly, so therefore their neurotransmitters aren't firing correctly, that causes mental health issues and also deficiencies. We know, you know, obviously in bipolar disease, we know that lithium, high dose lithium actually helps. Well, that's for a reason because we're actually deficient in something. So figuring out those deficiencies, fixing the gut bacteria so you actually get the nutrients from your food, which then helps mental health. Mm. And there's actually a really um, interesting study done on inmates and looking at inmates and what their deficiencies were and the ones that the most violent actually had the greatest deficiencies in specific minerals. And so by optimizing those minerals actually helped them to become more stable and less risky within the prison. So when you say 
when it says here, psychiatric drugs are lo- alone are the third leading cause of death, well, what happens if we looked at their gut bacteria? Traditional doctors don't do this. Looked at their gut bacteria, see what they're deficient in, repopulated their gut, fixed their diet. How many people wouldn't need psychiatric drugs? Incredible. And I'm, and I'm not telling anyone to come off of them, by the way. If you've been prescribed them, do what the doctor says. But, you know, I would look at your gut regardless and see what could be optimised so your body operates as it should.